Hello, everyone. My name is Timur. Um, it's great to be back here at C++ Russia. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm a C++ developer. I specialize in audio and music technology, and I've been now on the C++ standard committee for about three years. Um, I'm going to talk today about initialization in modern C++. And um, here's my um, introduction slide. Just going to let this play. Some of you might have seen this. I think this is brilliant. Um, so this is basically the summary of my talk. Uh, we're not going to talk about all of these things, but most of them. Um, I have um, found this on the internet about half a year ago, and I um, tweeted it. And there was a discussion on Twitter where someone pointed out, well, this is great, but actually it forgets to mention these other three types of initialization, which are not mentioned here. Um, yeah, and then there was um, a bit of a discussion about it, and someone at some point said, hey, you should do a talk about this. Um, and here I am. Um, so we heard a little bit about initialization from uh, Nico this morning in his keynote. Uh, here's a slide uh, from Nico where he came up with these uh, 19 different ways of initializing an int. Um, I think this is really interesting, that something so basic as initializing a variable can be so complicated. It's actually a really remarkable property for a programming language. I think it's pretty unique, probably. And um, there's probably no other area in the language that over the years has caused so many defect reports against the standard, fixes, changes. Uh, the rules of initialization change in the next standard, and then they get patched again in the standard after that. There's countless uh, blog posts on the internet how initialization in C++ is so complicated and so bonkers. So, um, this all means that giving a systematic overview over initialization in C++ is actually a really, really interesting challenge. Um, but I'll try anyway. So this talk um, is going to be about all the different ways to initialize an object in C++. And I'm going to go through this in chronological order, which means that first we're going to talk about what we inherited from C, then what we had since C++ 98, then some things were introduced in C++03, some things were introduced in 11, and then changed in 14 and changed in 17. I'm going to talk about what they all do, all the pitfalls and traps you can fall into, some recommendations, my personal recommendations, how to deal with those different um, things and how to actually use them effectively. And then, um, if we have time at the end, we're also going to talk about what's actually new in C++20 in the area of initialization, because, of course, stuff is going to change in 20 as well, again. And then at the end, there's going to be um, an overview table, actually an updated version of it. All right, so let's um, dive right in. Let's talk about C, because we basically inherited a lot of stuff from the C language. Um, so it turns out that C already has several way different ways to initialize an object or a variable. Um, and of course, the um, first one is this one, where you actually don't initialize the variable at all. You just don't give it an initializer. And uh, in C++, that's called default initialization. And I think that's a bit of a bad name, because it would suggest that somehow you would initialize it with some kind of default value. But that's not actually what's going on. You just don't initialize the value at all. And in C++ and in C, um, well, if you don't initialize a value, but then you access it, then this is undefined behavior, right? So this is, I think we all know this. This is pretty basic. Um, you know, if you have an int, you don't initialize it. Undefined behavior if you access it. Same is true for um, user-defined types. If you have a struct and it has, you know, some member variables in it, and you don't initialize them, and then you access them, of course, you get undefined behavior as well, right? Now, um, if you go from C to C++, we have all this fancy stuff. We have classes, we have constructors, we have public and private and methods. But then, of course, it turns out that um, none of the stuff actually helps or changes uh, this issue, right? So if you have a class with all these nice C++ things, but then you have members and you don't initialize them, and you access them, you are still going to get undefined behavior, right? So classes in C++ don't actually have any magic stuff to initialize their members. And that's actually interesting, because for the first couple of years of my career as a C++ developer, I did not know this. And the compiler wouldn't tell me. The IDE wouldn't tell me. Now I use an IDE that tells me, but I didn't have that back then. 
My colleagues didn't notice that in code review. So I'm pretty sure I introduced, in the, at the beginning of my career, some really uh, weird um, bugs uh, somewhere in production code out there because I just didn't know. It was unintuitive to me. Why should that be the case? Why do, you not, why do classes not initialize their, their variables, their members? Well, of course, they don't. And if you um, don't want undefined behavior, you have to initialize them yourself. In C++ 98, you can do that with a member initializer list. Um, this is not ideal because you kind of have to repeat that in every constructor and, and you, it's easy to forget one of them. And actually, the order in which you write this is not going to be the order in which they're going to be initialized. They're going to be initialized in the order in which they're declared. And there's all these uh, things. So C++ 11 introduced a much better way of doing this. You get these default member initializers, which means you just initialize all of them once. And then as long as you do that, you know um, that those members will always be initialized. Um, and actually, I should really stress this. This is actually my first recommendation. Uh, always use direct member initializers. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. If you have a class and you have members, always use direct member initializers if you can. Both with uh, built-in types like floats and ints, also with objects. And it really helps you if you get into this habit of initializing your members, um, then kind of you get to the habit of thinking about it consciously, that how do you, how you initialize them. For example, with an atomic, um, actually, the default constructor does not actually initialize the value, right? So you have to explicitly initialize it. Um, but then if you're in this habit of writing default member initializer, it kind of forces you to think about it. So I think, I think it's a good practice, and I think everyone should always do that. Right, so we talked about default initialization, which basically means no initialization and why no one should ever do this. The second way of initialization that we inherited from C is copy initialization, which is this thing where you declare a variable and you write equals value. So that's called uh, copy initialization. And it's not just when you, if you write equals value, but uh, you also get copy initialization if you um, pass in an argument by value into a function or if you return an object by value from a function. So in those three cases, initializing with equals value or passing by value or returning by value, you get copy initialization. Now, this is a bit confusing because there's this equals sign in there, so it looks like an assignment, but actually, this is never an assignment. The assignment operator is not going to get called. Nothing in this talk speaks about assignment. We are talking about initialization. Uh, another property of copy initialization is that um, if the types don't match, like you have one type and you try to initialize it with another uh, value of another type, then copy initialization will perform a conversion sequence, which you know, has some rules. Um, for example, one of those rules is that um, copy, uh, copy, uh, sorry, a conversion sequence will not call an explicit constructor because an explicit constructor is not a converting constructor. So it can only go through converting constructors, which means if you try to copy initialize uh, an object, but then the uh, constructor is marked explicit, you get a compiler error. More interestingly, if you have another constructor which actually is a worse match, so it doesn't match as good as the other constructor, this constructor might get called because the explicit one is being ignored by copy initialization. All right, so we have um, now default initialization and copy initialization. The third type of um, initialization we're going to talk about today is Aggregate initialization. And aggregate initialization is this thing, it works with arrays, uh, where you initialize uh, an array with a uh, braced and closed uh, list of values, and then it's going to initialize the elements of the array with those values. You can actually omit the size of the array, and then you get array size deduction. That's another special feature that aggregate initialization gives you. So it's going to deduce the type, uh, sorry, the size of the array from the number of initializers. And then it also works with um, aggregate types um, or aggregate classes more specifically, which means basically um, classes which are just a bag of, of um, public members. There's a few more rules, but basically these simple types that are just a bag of, of public members are these aggregate types, and you can initialize them also with this syntax, which means that they're going to be initialized um, element by element. And this actually has been there since C and C++ 98, this syntax was always available. Since C++11, we can actually omit the equal sign and we can write it like this. But for the case of aggregate types, it's going to do the same thing. 
what does it actually do? Um, this actually going to copy initialize the elements, right? So this is, this is important to remember what aggregate initialization actually does. If you in aggregate initialize an aggregate type, you're going to copy initialize its elements, which means, again, in this example, if you have an explicit constructor, and then you have um, you know, an aggregate type containing several of those widgets, and then you try to aggregate initialize them, that's going to copy initialize the individual, individual widgets. And if that's not possible, you're going to get a compiler error. Um, and that happens both with and without the equal sign. It's the same thing. And then again, you know, if you have this other constructor, which is not an explicit constructor, then that one is going to get called, and not the int one, which you might expect. Right? So aggregate initialization means element-wise copy initialization. Um, another special feature of aggregate initialization is this. Who can tell me what this program returns? Whether it's undefined behavior or it's valid, and if so, what does it return? Zero, Zero. very good. So a uh, special feature of aggregate initialization is that if you omit some of the elements from the end, those elements are going to be zero initialized, which is great because it means whenever you use aggregate initialization, you can never have uninitialized members and you can never have undefined behavior because of that. So that's great. This is why aggregate initialization is great. You can never have uninitialized members. Um, it also works with arrays. So if you just give it brace, brace, it's just going to zero initialize all 100 elements. So that's a very useful way of um, just zeroing out, you know, a chunk of memory. So we have the zero initialization if you omit something from the end. Another special feature of aggregate initialization is brace elision. Who can tell me what this program is going to return? So we have a widget, which is an aggregate of two integers, and then we have a thingy, which is another aggregate, which contains the widget and the integer as its two elements. And then we're going to give it two initializers, one and two. What's going to happen? Zero. Any other? Two? OK. Two, zero. Turns out it returns zero. So the way it works is if you have a sub aggregates, which are these nested aggregates, then uh, obviously you can initialize them by nesting the braces, but then you can elide those braces, which means you don't have to write the nested braces. And then basically what it does is kind of like, uh, recurses into the sub-aggregates, and this is the order in which it's going to initialize them. So 1 and 2 is actually the same as 1, 2, and 0, because you 1, 2 is going to apply to the widget, and then the k, the int k, is not going to be, doesn't have an initializer, and then it's going to be 0 initialized. So that's a bit tricky. Um, sometimes it's not really clear what's, what's going on there if you have sub-aggregates. And then uh, the last um, kind of thing that we inherited from C is a static initialization, right? So um, if you have a static variable, then it has the nice property that actually it always will be initialized. That's great. And it comes in kind of different flavors. So one of them is if you initialize it with a constant expression, then you're going to get constant initialization, which is this uh, example with the int. And that means essentially it happens at compile time. Um, and then if you don't initialize it, then actually, if it's static, it's then going to be zero initialized. So this is special rule, static variables are zero initialized by default, which means that this program, even though you didn't give the J an initializer, it's actually OK. So it's going to return 3 plus 0, which is 3. Um, so that's nice if you have um, constant initialization. Sometimes, though, you don't have that if you have a static object. And that's an example from a real world library that I was working on some time ago. So it had these, um, has this color class, which has you know, RGB. And then it was defining the um, typical colors, like red, green, blue, as static objects, like this. Um, and then, you know, as probably most of you know, if you do that, um, that's fine. But as soon as you have another static object, which then uses red in its initializer, the order in which static um, variables are initialized is undefined. So it means that you might be accessing an uninitialized variable there, and probably your application is just going to crash. Luckily, since C++11, there is a way to avoid that. If you give it a const expert constructor, and if you then initialize it again with a constant expression, then 
you get constant initialization again. And then the order doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about this initialization order fiasco because it's going to be constant initialization, which is at compile time, which will guarantee that it will work. Right. So this is kind of all the stuff that we inherited from C when we talk about initialization. We have default initialization, copy initialization, aggregate initialization, zero initialization, static initialization, which might do constant initialization. This is just what we inherited from C. Anyone has any questions about this so far? Everything clear? We're all on the same page. It's all basic stuff. We're all good? OK, cool. So C, of course, we're in C++. So you know, the wonderful C++ language that we all love introduces um, a few more features compared to C. Most important one, which one is the feature that C++ introduces, which is really important here? Constructors, thank you. So we got constructors in C++, exactly, which means that we can call them like this. So there's this new syntax, which doesn't exist in C, where you have round parens and you can initialize an object like this, and that's going to call a constructor. And by analogy, you can also use this new syntax, well, new, you know, 80s, 90s, when C++ was designed. Um, relatively new compared to C. Um, you can also use the same syntax to initialize built-in types like int and float, so it, it's kind of uh, consistent. Um, and this syntax is called direct initialization. Right? And direct initialization basically is what you get whenever the initializer is an argument list and round parens. Right? Then you get direct initialization. What does direct initialization do? Well, there's some differences to copy initialization, the one with the equal sign. For built-in types like int, bool, float, there's no difference. For class types, obviously, this syntax can take more than one argument, which is you know, why it was introduced in the first place. But also, it does not perform the conversion sequence thing that we saw earlier. Instead, it's going to call the constructor using overload resolution. Right? So the syntax looks like function call. It is a function call, right? essentially. And then it uses the same logic as you know, other functions in C++. It uses overload resolution and the rules for that, just for constructors. Which means, if we again have this example, we have a constructor which is not a converting constructor, but an explicit constructor. Copy initialization will not work. Direct initialization is fine. More interesting example, actually, if we have this double constructor again, copy initialization will call the first constructor and direct initialization will call the second constructor. So just by changing the syntax, and most people would expect that's the same if they don't know about the rules, they actually will end up calling different constructors. So it's important to be aware of this. Um, so as I said, direct initialization is what you get whenever you have round parens. So not, not just if you initialize an object like this, but also if you um, use this constructor call notation to um, initialize a temporary, or if you have a new expression with an initializer in parens, or if you have a static, if you have a cast expression, all these things use use round parens, and all these things will, are going to direct initialize the object. Of course, this syntax, which has been with us since the beginning of C++, has one big problem. Who knows what that is? It was mentioned by Nico in his keynote. Let's see. It's the most vexing pass, right? It means that everything that can be passed as a declaration will be passed as a declaration. So we have this widget class here and a thingy class which takes a widget in the constructor. And then you might think that you're initializing a thingy and give it a temporary, like a default constructed widget as a constructor argument. But what actually happens is you are declaring a function. Specifically, you are declaring a function that takes a function that takes nothing and returns a widget and returns a thingy. And that's going to compile, but that's probably not what you wanted. So that's very unfortunate. Um, that's kind of where we are um, in C++ 98. So we have the stuff that we inherited from C, and on top of that, we have direct initialization, and that gives us access to constructors. Everyone? Good so far? All right, let's move on. What's the next C++ version? 03. 03, all right. 
And most people think that C++03 is kind of a minor uh, bug fix release, nothing really changed. They say, ah, 9803 is kind of the same stuff. That's actually not true. C++03 introduced some interesting stuff. Can someone tell me a feature that was introduced in C++03? No? Okay, I can tell you one. C++03 introduced a new way of initializing stuff. It's called value initialization. And it's what you get if you have paren paren with nothing inside. So C++03 introduced a new way of initializing objects. Value initialization, what does it do? Actually, what does this program do? Yeah, you know. Someone else? Returns zero, exactly. So in C++98, this is undefined behavior because this would be default initialized. Then you access it, that's undefined. In C++03, paren paren is value initialization. Whenever you just get a pair of empty parens, and that's going to do zero initialization. So that's actually okay, that's going to just return zero. What does it actually do? Value initialization. So whenever you have paren paren, if the type has a user defined, sorry, a user provided default constructor, we're going to talk about this more in a minute. If you have a user provided default constructor, then you're going to call that default constructor. If you don't have one, you get zero initialization, like what we saw with the int. The int is going to be zero initialized. All right, so let's talk about this user provided default constructor stuff. Okay, what's going on here? What, what, what is this going to do? So we have a function that um, value initializes a new widget and then returns that widget and then you uh, access a member of this value initialized uh, widget in the return statement at the uh, bottom. What is this function going to do? Zero, correct. Since C++03, this is okay and this returns zero because, why? Exactly, because there is no user-provided default constructor, which means if you write a user-provided default constructor, then you break your program, and now it's undefined behavior, because now it's going to call the user-provided default constructor. That's not initializing I, undefined behavior. Right. So what does user-provided actually mean? It, it doesn't mean user-defined. User-provided means um, you actually provide the body of the constructor, like the curly braces, with potentially something inside. If you replace um, curly curly with equals default, you might think it's exactly the same thing, except modern way of writing it. Turns out that actually changes the meaning of your program. If you have equals default, that's a user defined um, constructor, but it's not a user-provided constructor because you did not provide the body of the constructor, right? And then you get zero initialization again. So that's user-defined but not user-provided because you did not provide the body, okay? There's one more twist to this. What happens if you take this widget paren paren equals default and move it outside of the class? So you just cha doesn't, don't change anything in the definition, but instead of having it inside the class, you just move it out of line. And now it again changes the meaning of your program. Because the equals default, if it's outside of the class, counts again as user provided. So it's not user provided if it's equals default, but only if it's inside the class. Yeah? So that, by just moving the equals default outside of the class, you break your program again, and now it's again undefined behavior. There's actually a logical reason for this, if you think about this. So if you, if you define the constructor outside of the class, then that might actually be in another translation unit, right? So in general, the compiler might not be able to see that you've written equals default, because it might be in another CPP file, which means it can't reason about it, which means that if you write equals default outside of the class, it's the same as if you would just write a body because the compiler might not be able to tell which one you did. So the equals default only works as advertised if you actually do it inside the class. All right. Everyone 
Everyone good with that? So user provided means you provide the body. If you do equals default, it's not user provided, except if it's outside of the class. So that's where we are in C++03. That's kind of classic, classic C++. Uh, so we have all these uh, different types of initialization now. OK. Now let's move on. After C++03, of course, we have C++11. And C++11 was really a game changer. C++11 changed the whole picture. It introduced this thing which I like to call unicorn initialization. Well, other people call it uniform initialization. Um, and that's this wonderful, magical thing. So why was this done? What was the motivation? Well, we've got too many different initialization syntaxes, right, as you already saw. And they do all different things. And then we have paren uh, the parens, which have this vexing pass problem, which is annoying. And also the other um, issue that um, people felt annoyed by is that you can do the aggregate initialization syntax with uh, arrays, like raw arrays, but you cannot do it with other things which are like arrays, like, for example, containers, like vector. That doesn't work. Instead, you have to do this reserve and pushback stuff. Or um, there was a boost library for this, like boost init or whatever it was called, with like lots of ugly macros. Sorry? Boost assign, thank you. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who remembers boost assign? Oops. I think this is falling off. All right. Um, so, C++11 um, tried to fix all these things by introducing one more initialization syntax, which is this one with the braces but without the equal sign. And the idea behind it is, let's just have one syntax for everything. And it will do just the right thing. You know, depending on what kind of type you have, it's just going to do the right thing for that type. And then because it's a new syntax with the curly braces, it also doesn't conflict with the uh, function declaration syntax, so you, you also fix the, the vexing pass problem. OK, so that sounds pretty good so far, right? Um, that actually works most of the time. So what we actually get, what's called, is list initialization. And it comes in two flavors. You have direct list initialization, which is this new syntax with the brace brace. And then you have equals brace brace. And that's called copy list initialization. Now remember, copy initialization is if you have equals something. And then copy list initialization is if you have equals list. And this list is called a braced init list. So that's the thing with the braces. And it's really important to remember that that's not an object, really. It doesn't have a type. It's this new uh, magic uh, construct. Um, and uh, so if you have an aggregate type, you know, it's just going to be do aggregate type as before, so it's not a breaking change. But um, in this new world, it can do other things, uh, like um, so as I said, braced init list is, doesn't really have a type, but it has this magic property which makes this work. So um, the magic property of the braced init list is that it doesn't really have a type, but it can implicitly convert to a std initializer list, which is this new magic library type. And that means that if you have a constructor taking a std initializer list, then it's going to call that. And that's basically how this list initialization stuff works. And um, here's, I think, where the C++ committee kind of didn't quite get it right, in my opinion. So I think, um, you know, it's a good idea, it's a good problem to solve, but the solution, I think, kind of creates more problems than it actually solves. Because, so we have the std initializer list stuff, but the first problem is it's actually a new kind of magic library container type, right? So it's basically like a fixed size uh, vector with const elements. So it actually has a type, right? So it has begin and end uh, functions, which return iterators. Uh, it has its own iterator type. Uh, you need to include a header if you want to use it. Um, also, because elements in the, of the initial list are const, the thing is not movable. So you can't, if, if t is a, move, if a move, move only type, then it just doesn't work. It creates really a bunch of problems. The second problem with, uh, with this is that initialize the list is, is actually an object, right? So the semantics are that you actually create an object and pass around an object. And you know, compilers will mostly optimize all of this away, but like semantically, you know, you're actually creating and passing around these, these extra objects. Um, and um, yeah, so um, there was this uh, poll on Twitter a few months ago. Um, <laughs> 
where the question basically was, uh, if you had a time machine, you could go back in time and remove one feature from C++, which one would you choose? And the most popular answer was the initializer list. Um, there's this other talk uh, by Jason Turner, um, which is a 90-minute talk uh, just about how uh, all the problems with initializer lists. So if you want to kind of dive, deeper, uh, uh, sorry, um, dive deeper into this topic and understand the problems with initializer lists, I really recommend you watch this talk. It's quite interesting. So what does initializer list actually do? Right. So the, this brace in it syntax. It, it calls constructors with uh, which take an initializer list. And the way it does that um, creates a few problems when you compare it to the old syntax with the direct initialization. So probably the most uh, famous example of this is this vector example, where if you call vector with two integers and you use um, you know, direct, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. If you use a direct initialization, uh, then it's going to call a constructor. There is a constructor that actually takes you know, two integers in this case, like one size and one element value. And it's going to construct three um, a vector that contains three times the value zero. But then instead, if you use brace init list, it's going to do the initializer list thing, which means it's going to construct a vector that has two elements, three and zero. Now, this is actually not the most confusing example. There's uh, actually um, even more surprising things. So let's consider um, this example. So the first one is a string, and again, it has a constructor. It takes a size and uh, a character, and then it's going to construct a string with 48 times the character A. That's, you know, nothing new. But then if you just use the same thing with braces, what's going to happen now? Anyone knows? Sorry, what? Two characters? Okay, which ones? Zero, yes. So, what this is going to do is, it's going to say, oh, you're trying to, uh, you know, do this initializer list thing. Okay, so string takes an initializer list of characters. 48 is an integer, but, you know, I can convert it to a character. So, actually, 48 is the ASCII code for the character zero, and then you get zero and A. And that's, I think, really, really confusing, because there is actually a constructor that is a perfect match, right? It takes an integer, and a char, or like a size t in a char, I think. So that's like a, almost like a perfect match. So you obviously want to call that, but that's not what's going to happen. Instead, it's going to do this really weird conversion from integer to character, and so that it can somehow, through this like really unusual conversion that you really probably didn't want to do, uh, can write a std initializer list. And then you just get another string, which is really surprising, and you don't even realize, actually, uh, probably, when you do this. Um, so this, this kind of stuff that sometimes it calls the constructor that you expect, and sometimes it calls something else, um, that's even more annoying if you have templated code. So let's look at this example. Uh, what is this program going to return? So we have um, a template here, a, a function template, and then you have a vector of t's, and then you're going to give it a brace init list with, with a number. And then you're going to instantiate that with string and, and three. Anyone wants to guess what this is going to do? Um, what is this returning? The size of the vector. What's the size of the vector? One. Anyone has another idea? Three. All right. So you're doing vector string in braces three. Okay. That's going to construct. Um, a vector with three strings in it. But if you then change the string to int, to return test int three, what's going to happen then? One, right? Because then vector int, oh, you have a brace init list, there's an int in there. Okay, let's you know use the initializer list. So it either, depending on what template parameters you give it, it's, it's going to either call the initializer list constructor or it's going to call the other one. You don't know. Okay, so string returns three, int returns one. What does it do for float? I don't actually know. <laughs> it's really hard to reason about this code. If you have brace init list in a, inside from templates, most of the time you can't really, don't really know what's going on there. And that's really a problem because, for example, you can't write an in-place function that works for aggregates with braces. You can't work, you can't write um, make unique function for aggregates. It just doesn't work. <laughs> 
You just can't use aggregate initialization uh, uh, in just brace syntax in, in templates this way. So what does list initialization actually do? All right, so obviously for aggregate types, it's going to do aggregate initialization, just like it did before. For built-in types, like int or float, uh, direct list initialization is going to do direct initialization, and copy list initialization is going to do copy initialization, so that's also not very surprising. For class types, at first, greedily tries to call a constructor that takes a std initializer list. It's going to try to find all kinds of weird conversions in order to be able to do that. And only if it absolutely cannot call a std initializer list constructor will it do the same thing as the parens. It's going to just call a constructor using overload resolution. Or if you have a um, copy a list initialization that takes a single element, like equals one element, then it might copy initialize if you have no std initializer list constructor. And there's actually, unfortunately, one more exception, which is empty braces, you know, curly, curly, and that's special again. So let's say you have a type which has uh, a default constructor, and then a constructor takes an initializer list, right? And then um, you do curly, curly. What would you expect? You would probably expect it would call the initializer list constructor because you give it a braced init list. But no, because it's empty, there's a special case. It's going to call the default constructor. And only if there is no default constructor, it's going to call the std initializer list constructor. And if that's also not there, then it's going to do value initialization. So you need to keep these uh, rules in mind if you use uh, brace brace. And that's really unfortunate because it makes it so much more complicated. Uh, Juan P has a question. What if you have a constructor with an argument with a default value? If you have a constructor with an argument with a default value. And then if you, ha if you don't have an initializer list constructor, it's going so to you call that. And then you do uh, curly, curly. Yeah. It's going to call that one with a default argument, I think. Okay. But let's, let's check it. So curly, curly is not going Does that count as a default? Yeah, let's check it. I think it counts as a default constructor, and then it's going to call that. Okay. But I'm not 100% sure, so let's check it. So you see, even if you have spent years actually uh, you know, thinking about the stuff and writing proposals for the standard, that I still don't know everything. It's <laughs> right. Um, so we get value initialization. Oh, and then because you have value initialization, we have this thing again that if it's equals default, then it, you get zero initialization. But if it's param paren, then you, you get that's going to be called. And then, but then if it's outside of line, then we've talked about this before. All right, list init has another um, special property, which is narrowing conversions, which are not allowed. I think that's actually pretty useful. Um, so what happens here is that if you have an int and you try to direct list initialize it with uh, a double, then that's narrowing conversion. That's not going to compile. Same with aggregate initialization. If you have an aggregate taking ints and you give it a list of doubles, that's not going to compile. That's actually the single most popular um, a single most often occurring uh, breaking change if you move your code from uh, classic C++ to modern C++. In classic C++, aggregate initialization was allowed to do these uh, conversions. In C++11, uh, it doesn't. So whenever you have aggregate initialization with narrowing conversions, all this stuff is going to break if you switch to C++11. Uh, it's a problem with uh, big legacy code bases. You need to go into your code and fix all these cases. Um, so list in it also, unlike the aggregate initialization, if you do um, initialize a list constructors, um, you can have nested braces, but you don't get brace elision. You only get brace elision if you have aggregate initialization. And on, on one hand, it's really nice because you can use nested braces very, in a very useful way, and you can actually see what's going on. Like, for example, if you have a map, the elements of a map are pairs, right? So if you have nested braces, then the outer thing is going to be the initializer list for the map and then the inner braces are going to brace initialize uh, the pairs, right? So you're going to get a map with two elements, and each element is a pair, and it's going to be constructed with this, um, with this list of two, two values. So that's the good case. That's the evil case. What is this program going to do? <laughs> 
So this is not aggregate initialization, right? We're talking about list initialization and a split initializer list. So the first one, the v1 vector, is a vector of string, and you give it an initializer list with two string literals. So obviously, you're going to get a vector with two strings. If you add a level of nested braces, what's going to happen? What did he say? Memory dump, yes. Undefined behavior, exactly. Why? So it turns out, actually, um, you can reason about this. So if you have nested braces and you're calling initializer list, you have to think from the outside to the inside. Right, so the outer list, how many elements does it have? This is how many elements you're going to get. The outer list has one element, which is the inner list. So you're going to get one element. So you're going to get a vector with one string. And then it's going to initialize, um, list initialize the string with the inner list. So you're trying to list initialize a string with a brace init list with two uh, const char star. And it turns out, well, um, string has a, a constructor that takes a begin and end uh, char iterators. So it's going to convert the char literal const char to, it's going to treat it as a pair of begin and end iterators. And then it's going to start reading from the beginning and then it's going to read into uninitialized memory and your program is going to crash, which is probably not what you would expect. The important thing to remember here is you know, think from the outside to the inside, and if you don't have an aggregate, then you don't get a brace addition. Right. Um, so um, passing and returning brace init lists is actually also copy list initialization, and that's actually also really useful. So you can pass uh, a brace init list. It's a bit with the, so if you, if you um, return something by value, you get copy initialization. So if you return a brace init list, you're going to get copy list initialization. And if you pass in a brace init list to a function, you're also going to get copy list initialization. Um, then there, is, there are a few problems with that, of course, because then you might again have nested braces. So there was um, recently this delightful uh, post on Stack Overflow where someone had the same function call with different levels of braces, and it turns out that they all do something different. And then there was this really delightful discussion where people tried to figure out um, what's actually going on there. So I'm not going to go into, into this, but um, kind of it's, it's complicated. So um, this is where we are in C++11. We have all these types of initialization from C, C++98, C++03, and then we get this list initialization, which comes in two flavors, and it might do any of these things sometimes with not very obvious rules. Empty braces is a special case. It's useless in temp, well, almost useless in templates. And there's a few other pitfalls. Um, C++14 fixed a few things. So that was good. One, one thing that people ran frequently into, which is kind of surprising and unnecessary, is that in C++11, aggregates could not have uh, direct member initializers, which is really bad because direct member initializers are useful, and as I said before, you should always use them, but then you have an aggregate type, and C++11, it would then not be an aggregate type anymore, and you couldn't aggregate initialize it anymore. So that was fixed in C++14. Aggregates can now have direct member initializers, which I think is great, so this code is going to work. The second fix is, I think Nico talked about this uh, this morning in his keynote, it has to do with auto. So there was this uh, kind of annoying thing in C++11 that if you have auto and then you have a brace init list, that would also always uh, deduce the type of std initializer list, which is probably not what you want, because if you write auto i3, you probably wanted to do int i3. But then in C++11, that would deduce a std initializer list of int, which is not very useful most of the time. So in C++14, the rules were changed. That's actually a breaking change. Um, so um, auto i brace 3 was an initializer list in C++11, and C++14, that is now an int. So that's the, the first of the two um, red um, ones. So in C++14, if you do auto i and then do brace, and you have one value in there, it's going to uh, do the same thing as if you just write auto i and just initialize it normally without the brace. And if you have more than one element in the brace, that's going to not compile. So the auto i3 will always be an int. And the auto i equals 3 will always be an initializer list. So it's inconsistent now still with int i, because um, 
if you have direct list initialization, you're going to get the int. If you have copy list initialization, you're going to get the initializer list. But at least it's kind of more consistent with itself. It's a bit easier to remember. If you have equals brace, you always get an initializer list with the auto. Uh, and there was also another minor fix in C++14 about static initialization, but it's not really that important. You can look it up if you want. But even in C++14, there are quite a few problems with list initialization left. So as we saw, it's difficult to see uh, you know, whether the std initializer list constructor is called or whether it's not being called. std initializer list itself is, has problems, like it doesn't work with move-only types. It's actually an object and so on. It's practically useless in templates, which means that we can't write for example, things like emplace or make unique for aggregates. And there's these, these non-obvious rules where the empty braces are special, nested braces can be confusing. Uh, the way it works with auto is kind of also not really um, obvious. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention is uh, macros. So it turns out that list uh, initialization doesn't work at all inside a macro. Like if you have assert, assert is a macro. If you write the same thing, widget, and then with parents, that's fine because um, Macro uh, has a special parsing rule where if, if there's a comma but it's inside parens, it's going to be parsed correctly. But if you have curlies, uh, the special parsing rule for macros was never was not changed to accommodate that case, which means if you have widget curly to comma, the macro will think that this is the end of the first macro argument. And then the stuff after the comma is the second macro argument, even though you're inside braces. And then basically the parser will just break which is unfortunate. So here's my personal recommendations, how to use this stuff. So personally, I use copy initialization for simple things, you know, equals three, because that's how most programming languages are doing it. It's clear, people are used to it, it's, it's easy to see what's going on. Um, so this is what I do. Uh, braces are useful for the things that they're, they're really good for, the special cases where Braces actually do something useful. Braces can do aggregate initialization, which is useful. Braces can call initializer list constructors, like with containers. If that's what you want to do, use them. And then the other thing where braces are really good is in direct member initializers, because you cannot use the direct initialization syntax in direct member initializers. So you need to use braces there. So this is where they're really useful. And the other case is they're also really useful for passing and returning temporaries, right? So if you quickly want to create a temporary and you don't want to run into parsing problems, uh, you can do that and you can actually, um, you know, if you quickly want to value initialize a temporary, you just do curly curly, that's always going to work. And often you can actually omit the type name at all and just use the brace init list. That only works with, with braces. So this is where they're really useful and where I use them. If I just want to call a constructor, like a normal constructor, personally, I use direct initialization. I use the classic syntax. And I know this is a controversial guideline because Nico this morning said he likes using braces. I personally like using parens. So again, it's my personal style, which I think is useful because it's easier to reason about. If you have parens, it looks like a function call. You, you, you know it's just going to do overload resolution. Right? You know the rules for that. There's no weird cases where it might or might not be the initializer list thing. Uh, if you want to use that, just use it explicitly. And I think that's cleaner, that's easier kind of to understand, that's easier to reason about. If you look at code, you know what it does. So this is why I prefer this syntax. There's actually one problem with the syntax, of course, which is the vexing parse, but it turns out there's another recommendation which gets rid of this problem, which is um, auto. So there was this um, article by Herb Sutter in 2013 talking about this almost always auto recommendation where basically you should always, when you initialize a new object, you should always use auto. And I think that's great because it means that you can never leave it uninitialized, right? You can't write auto i semicolon. That's a compile error. So if you use auto consistently in your code, you can never forget to initialize a variable, which is really, really good. And if you need to write the type explicitly, you can do it, but do it on the right-hand side. Means the same thing, but prevents you from forgetting to initialize it. So I think this auto uh, recommendation is really great. And it turns out it actually also fixes the vexing pass problem. If we do this thing, but we write auto, and then you write the type on the right side, turns out there is no more vexing pass problem. It just goes away. 
So originally, um, it was known as the almost always auto rule because in C++11 and 14, it would not compile sometimes. Like for example, with an atomic, this syntax would not compile because an atomic, atomic is uh, not copyable, not movable. And even though this syntax would never actually copy or move anything, it would just initialize it, um, there was this annoying thing where it would still require that there was a copy or a move constructor, even if it was not called. It just had to be there, and if it was not there, the program would not compile. Fortunately, in C++17, this was fixed. This is what we now know as guaranteed copy elision in C++17, which means, nope, we don't need that anymore. If it's not copyable, not movable, you can still use the syntax. It's just going to do the normal initialization. Uh, the only difference is you just wrote the type on the, on the right-hand side and not on the left-hand side. Otherwise, it's the same thing. So that's great. So my recommendation is always use auto. The only case where you cannot use it is, again, in direct member initializers. So you cannot declare members of a class with auto. So there, you cannot use it. It's not allowed there. But OK. Um, the other feature that was introduced in C17 is CTAD, or class template argument deduction. And it turns out CTAD also has a very kind of sometimes not obvious and confusing interactions with initialization. Unfortunately, we have only 10 minutes left, so I can't go into this. But Nico has talked about this a little bit in his keynote this morning. And I actually have um, done uh, a talk at CPPCon last year, which is one hour just about CTAD. So there I go into all these cases and exceptions and things that you need to keep in mind. So if you're interested in how CTAD interacts with initialization, go and watch this talk. But still, in C17, basically, we are where we were in C11 and 14, except we fixed some of the really annoying things. So I think it's an improvement, but I still think that list initialization is very problematic. Um, all right, so we have 10 minutes left, so I can talk a little bit about the future. C20, the new upcoming standard, which is hopefully going to be released next year. And of course, in the new C20 standard, we have a new way of initializing objects. Yes. And it's called designated initialization. And it's basically, um, so this was introduced in C, uh, in C99, and now we also get it in C. So this is basically a C compatibility feature, and it's Aggregate initialization with this other syntax, where instead of providing the things from the beginning, uh, and then you might omit some, and then you get zero initialization for those that you omitted in the end, you can actually initialize you know, any subset of the elements, and then the rest is going to be zero initialized, and you just name them. So in this case, you have A, B, C, and you initialize A and C, and B is going to be zero initialized. So it's really useful. Again, you have this thing that if you use this, you can never end up with uninitialized members, so that's great. Um, so it only works for aggregate types, so it's just a different syntax for aggregate initialization. It's a C compatibility feature. It works like in C++99 with a few exceptions. And those all have actually good reasons. So one thing is that in C you can um, initialize them out of order, like you can initialize C first and A then A. You cannot do that in C++ because in C++, the order of initialization actually matters, right? So things are constructed in the order of declaration and destructed in the opposite order. So the order actually matters. That's not the case in C. So in C++, you cannot do it out of order. It's unfortunate. It, it reduces a little bit the cases where you can use it, but it's still useful. The other thing you cannot do in C++ is nest them, so like this kind of .c, .e, like sub-aggregate nesting. But it turns out you can still do that with like an extra brace. So you can still say .c, brace, .e, so that's fine. Uh, you cannot mix designated initializers with normal initializers. You can do that in C. You cannot do that in C++. But honestly, I have no idea why anyone would ever want to do this because it's really messy. And the other limitation is that you cannot use it with arrays. But again, I don't know if that's actually that useful. Um, all right, so what else do we have in C++20? Uh, we have a few, again, a few small fixes, um, basically um, changes, like little changes. Some of them are proposals that I've been working on. Uh, one of them is uh, this thing. And I'm really happy about this fix. So there was this really annoying thing in uh, C17, or we have this annoying thing in C17, that if you delete the default constructor, most of the time when you do that, what you want to say is don't, like, you should not be able to initialize this object. Like, you should not be able to create an instance of this object. I delete the default constructor. But it turns out that if your type is an aggregate, 
Yeah, so you cannot default initialize it because it's going to say, well, the default constructor is deleted, but you can still aggregate and initialize it. So just by writing curly curly, you're kind of circumventing this equals delete thing that the author of this class wrote, which is really confusing. Most people don't know about this. It results in weird things that people don't intend you to be able to do. So in C++20, we changed the rules. Um, and in C++20, as soon as you declare any kind of constructor, the type is no longer an aggregate. So you can never get into the situation that constructors and aggregate initialization somehow conflict with each other, which I think is, is a clean solution. So you know, just by looking at the class, if there's no constructors declared from the user, um, then it's not, uh, then, it's an then it can be an aggregate, otherwise it's not an aggregate. And in C++17, we have the same mess where um, it's an aggregate if it, if it doesn't have any user uh, provided constructors, right? So, yeah, you remember this, 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 this stuff, right? So, C20, very easy. As soon as you declare any kind of constructor, it's not an aggregate anymore. Um, the other paper uh, was this. It was really a tiny kind of consistency fix where people ask, okay, how do race init lists work? And you can also use them in uh, new expressions. And the question is, um, so if you use them in new expressions, do they work the same way as if you use them in, in normal initialization? It turns out, well, most of the time, yes, but there's this annoying uh, uh, exception where brace init list doesn't do um, size deduction uh, in new expressions. And the reason for that, it was simply overlooked when in C++11 brace init was introduced. There was a special rule how you do array size deduction in new expressions, and that was just not adjusted. So it was just an oversight. We fixed that. Um, and C++20 is not something that you would normally write, I guess, but it just makes it a bit more consistent. I think that's good. And then the very last thing that I wanted to mention is um, there's yet another way of initializing things in C++20, which we're going to get. So we saw uh, that there are these problems with list initialization. These two are particularly annoying because they occur with aggregate types. So you cannot really write in place and make unique for aggregates because this brace syntax doesn't work with templates and it doesn't work with macros, which means you cannot aggregate initialize in macros. And both of these problems are going to go away in C++20 because in C++20 you can direct initialize aggregates, which means you can use aggregate initialization with parens instead of curlies, which is great because now you can finally write in place and make unique for aggregates which is really useful if you're writing a library. So this will work in C++20. This is aggregate initialization. Of course, you should write it like that, right? Remember, always auto. Uh, and then it also works with arrays, so you will be able to initialize an array like this. And I think this is, this is great, because this actually somehow gives us, I call it uniform initialization 2.0, because it's kind of, it makes it more uniform again. So what happens here is that if you can do aggregate initialization with parens, if you think about it, then parens and curlies are going to do the same thing almost all of the time, right? So they can write, they can call constructors, they can do aggregate initialization, they can initialize uh, built uh, in types, uh, except um, if you have an initializer list constructor. And then, you know, if you want to call that, you use braces. If you don't want to call that, don't use braces. So you can really be explicit about what your intent is, and I think that's nice. And the other thing is that brace, um, Braces don't allow narrowing conversions, and this new parent syntax will allow them, just to be consistent with uh, constructor calls. Right. So this is what we're going to get in CSS20. I think it's an improvement. I think it's great. Um, just again, the recommendations. Um, always use direct member initializers. Always use auto. Again, personally, I prefer the um, direct initialization syntax to call constructors, because I think it's easier to think, to, to understand what's going on, but I know it's controversial, and I know Nico this morning said the exact opposite, so it kind of comes down to your personal preference. The important thing is that you understand the rules. And then my last slide is um, a summary of everything we talked about. And um, if you uh, find me on Twitter, I have pinned this um, slide to my profile, so you can find it there. So basically, uh, the, the rows are all the different kinds of types, like aggregate types or built-in types and so on. And the columns are all the different initialization syntaxes. And for each one, this table tells you what they do. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. You can find me on Twitter, Timo Audio.